Hey everybody, this is Alex Merced, and uh, this, welcome to the next part of our series here um, on Apache Iceberg. And basically what we'll be talking about is an overview of the Apache Iceberg architecture. Like basically how does it work in the sense like we know that Apache Iceberg defines metadata. And that metadata allows engines to understand the table and plan queries in a way that's fast. But how is that organized? So let's take a look. So again, Apache Iceberg's architecture looks like this. Basically, essentially, like this is kind of like how everything is kind of laid out. It all starts with a catalog. So we mentioned before, the catalog is what allows us to know what tables exist. So every table, kind of like, you know, you think of a phone book back in, let's say, the 90s, when you'd grab like the yellow pages and you would look up Bob's phone number and that's how you knew that Bob lived in town and what his phone number was. Uh, the catalog allows me to go look up a table and find out where its metadata file is. Um, so that's generally always going to be where the engine goes. And then the actual data about the table is broken up into three categories, metadata files, manifest lists, and manifest files. Think of metadata files as sort of like the global table-wide um, metadata. So it's basically what is, a scheme, what is a schema and previous schema? What is the partition and previous partitions? What is the newest snapshot? What are the previous snapshots? Basically, all this very high-level detail is going to be in the metadata file. So basically, we're going to read this file, and we're going to gather that data. Okay, so that way we know what the table schema is, so we know what the output should look like, or um, and so forth. And then we're going to have the manifest list. So once we identify which, this is the snapshot level metadata. So what's going to happen is that every time the table updates, we're creating a new snapshot. And each snapshot has a corresponding manifest list. And what a manifest list does is lists groups of files <coughs> that are part of that snapshot. So each group of files is a separate file called a manifest. So manifest versus manifest list. Um, and the reason being is that it's I can actually plan a query much faster if I'm able to eliminate groups of files versus just having to narrow eliminate all of them one by one. And that's one of the nice things about Iceberg that you have this extra layer here, this like middle layer. Uh, that allows me to kind of eliminate groups of files at a time, okay? Uh, which you know could be uh, in a variety of ways. Um, so oftentimes, this may be these these manifests might be grouped by like partitions. So I'm able to like go through at the, at the manifest level. I'm going to have like metadata that's going to let me just kind of look through. Okay, here are all the groups of files. These belong to these partitions. I don't need to look at that data, so toss that out. And that way, when I get down to the manifest level, where I'm looking at the actual like itemized list of files, I only have to eliminate. I'm only eliminating going to that next level of pruning uh, at a much smaller level. Okay, um, I've already eliminated big chunks at that point. And then again, the manifest is where we actually list individual files that may or may not need to be scanned. And basically, once we got to that point and we've narrowed down the actual files we need to scan, we can then go scan the actual data files. Okay, so essentially we have, again, those three layers that allow an engine to understand what the table is and plan the query on that table. The metadata file, the manifest list, and the manifest. So let's actually, like, again, go over these components to the Iceberg format. So again, we start off, we have the catalog. Think of the catalog as the phone book. Now, like, lots of things can be the catalog. The idea is just there has to be something that an engine connects to that it can know absolutely what is the latest metadata file. Because every time you make an update to a table, not only are you creating a new snapshot, but a new metadata file. And you always want to read the newest one because the newest one's going to have the current and all previous snapshots in it. Um, but the only way we know which is the newest one is there's going to be an entry in that catalog. And that catalog acts generally going to be some sort of something that can provide asset guarantees because that's going to be the way we kind of make sure we can prevent like bad, you know, any problems with concurrency and writing and stuff like that. Um, you do have the option of using HDFS as your catalog, meaning you can actually use like just your file system as your catalog, which it'll just read the table directory. Um, problem with that, then, you, you know, it's not generally recommended if you, in production if you're going to be having multiple writers because you'll have concurrency issues because you don't have that locking mechanism that you would with other catalogs, such as a Hive Metastore, um, Project Nessie, uh, AWS Glue, using a JDBC database, um, the new REST catalog, uh, all sorts of different things. Okay, generally these other things will have other mechanisms that allow you to 
manage concurrency safely. Okay, but that's what the catalog is. It's basically the way we track what tables exist. Okay, and the benefit of that is it'll tell us what the new metadata file is. Then we get to the metadata file, and that metadata file again is going to give us the table-wide metadata. Okay, every table is going to have a unique ID. Every table has a default location. So generally, like when you write files to the table, generally it's going to get written to that default location. But again, as I've mentioned in the previous videos, they don't have to be in that directory. As long as they're in those manifests where we list the individual files and we say, hey, here's what that file is going to be. As long as we have those paths, we're good. Um, but generally, there's going to, there is going to be sort of a place where we generally think of this is the table's place. Uh, the schema, this is the current schema. The partition spec, like what is the current way this table is being partitioned? What is the current snapshot? What are the previous snapshots? And again, you not only would you have the previous snapshots, but you'd also actually have an array of schemas, an array of partition specs. So that way you know if I were to go back and query, basically each schema has like an ID number and each partition spec has an ID number. So that way when you take a look at a particular snapshot and you take a look at a particular like manifest and manifest lists, we'll be able to actually categorize saying, okay, hey, these files were written with this schema and this partitioning spec. These files were written with this partitioning spec. And that's really going to allow us to have that evolvability of the table because we're able to granularly t identify this is associated with this because we got all this nice global metadata, which is really nice. But from the metadata file, we'd identify which snapshot we we're looking to look at. It'll tell us where the manifest list for that snapshot is. And then we'd go look at that manifest file. And again, in the manifest list, we are seeing all these manifests being listed, not the individual data files, but these manifests. Okay. And each manifest represents a group of files. And the cool thing is, it'll tell us, okay, hey, here's this group of files, this manifest. This manifest, okay, was added at the snapshot. So, like, so, so essentially, that's when these group of files, this particular manifest was created. So that way, again, it allows it to, like, be able to trace things back, and, 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 and you can find ways to optimize your query if you can kind of relatively kind of configure things. Um, but I can figure out, hey, what partition spec this particular partition represents, and we can use any filters in our query that have to deal with the partitioned, uh, field or column and we can begin saying okay hey does this particular manifest apply to our particular query and if it doesn't so like for example let's say I it's partitioned by a month and I say hey I want all data in June but this particular manifest represents data in July we can just toss out the whole manifest okay I don't have to go individually assess those files in those manifests I can just toss out that whole group okay um, and that's pretty useful Okay, um, and there's other metadata that, that is going to exist there for the partition um, field to be able to kind of like, again, narrow that down. Cool. And the cool thing is that like, let's say you're partitioning by that field. Again, it's going to have like the range in that field as well. So it might, um, you know, it might cover a particular range and you'll be able to like, bottom line is you can reduce chunks of files. That's like the beauty of the manifest list. Now, once we've kind of gone through the manifest list and gotten rid of every manifest that we can eliminate and say, hey, we don't need to scan these or we don't even go further with these particular manifests, then we take a look at the manifests that still survive, like that are still standing, We're like, okay, hey, these might actually have files we want to look at. And then these manifest files are going to have a list of several different files. And you can see here for each file, it's going to say, okay, hey, where does that file exist? What kind of format is that file? How is that file partitioned? Okay. Or what partition spec was applied to that file? How many records do we expect to be in that file, in that count? And again, all these can be used um, when to optimize certain queries, to speed up certain aggregations. Um, so there's a lot of these column level statistics. Okay, so for example, again, how many records are in the file? Also, like the bounds for each individual column. So we can actually, so depending on how you set up your table, uh, by default it'll like, track most columns and say, okay, hey, this column, the range in this file is from here to here. For this column, the range in this file is here to here. So if I have other filters, so if I have a filter on some other field, like let's say age, which I'm not partitioned by, okay, but let's say I'm partitioning and say, hey, I want to get everybody between 20 and 30. At this level, at this manifest level, it can then begin basing it on the min and what's called min and max filtering, saying, okay, hey, does this file actually have anybody who's between the age of 20 and 30, according to their min and their upper and lower bounds? Yes, no, 
and then we can begin limiting individual files. Okay, and those, which again, each file is going to be a clump of records. And that's just going to continue narrowing down what we need to look at. And essentially, we keep doing that until we've gone through all the manifests. And then at this point, we'll have a list of files that do need to be scanned. But we're going to have the narrowest list of files that need to be scanned. And that's going to tremendously speed up the planning because, you can, again, you're narrowing down you know, at a higher level and then you're getting more granular as you go down instead of just being granular from the get-go. Um, and two, it's going to be um, faster because, again, you're, you're, not, you're only scanning much less files. You're not, you don't, it's not like a hive where you're like having to, at minimum, scan a whole partition. We can even, once we even narrow down the partitions, we can go back in there and get rid of a lot of the files and only scan what you truly need to. Okay, and that's what's gonna make Apache Iceberg queries super, super fast and allow engines to really improve their performance when they're scanning an Apache Iceberg uh, table. At the end of the day, also keep in mind though, it's up to the engine to actually engineer that whole like scanning process. So while there's like a clear path here, you know, different engines might take advantage of this data differently. Okay, so they might, um, generally what we just went through is probably what you should expect from any engine. But again, there's a lot of this column specific metadata can sometimes be used for even like cooler stuff. And it just depends on like how the engine, how the developers for that engine decide to like really like use this data to get the maximum performance. Okay. Um, so that's a, that's a neat thing there. So again, at the end of the day, uh, the, that point that I was just trying to make is just that, you know, um, Apache Iceberg again is a specification. So two engines that support Iceberg doesn't necessarily mean they're going to have like the same performance and same things like that. So you always want to make sure you test the tools that you want to use. Um, but again, Apache Iceberg enables superior performance for the tool, for the, the tools that decide to support it. Okay. And in our next video, we're going to be going over Iceberg transactions step by step. So we're actually going to go through some specific transactions, kind of see how they play out, so that way you can better understand sort of like what Iceberg. Um, what, a, what, an, what an engine you'd expect an engine to do as they take that iceberg metadata and try to execute a query against it. Okay, but with that, I'll see you in the next video. Have a great one and enjoy.